What was so important at this site that the Saudi government put fences and warning signs all around it? We have uh, uncovered some very important information. You nearly lost your life in the desert of Saudi Arabia. We really thought that they would execute us for being spies. Two explorers embark on a dangerous mission into a forbidden land and reveal a stunning trail of evidence that is shaking the very foundations of archaeology. We stood there for a moment and I turned to Larry and I said, Larry, I said, what are we doing here? Without breaking stride, he turned to me and he smiled and said, Bob, we're making history. Solving one of mankind's greatest mysteries, a mystery over 3,000 years old. Jim Irwin gave me a letter that had been written by a man who had been in Saudi Arabia how he had seen a mountain that could be Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, the site of the greatest encounter between God and man, where God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. And we found, to our amazement, that there's a fence going around the mountain. What we saw was fences, fenced off all around the mountain. Armed with little more than their wits in the Bible, explorers Bob Cornuk and Larry Williams set off on a real-life adventure you'll never forget, tracing step by step the compelling trail of evidence that confirms the Bible as historically accurate. We found an underwater land bridge that comes out of the depths of the deep ocean and creates a roadway through the sea to the other side. We had to look for a large altar where they made the golden calf and there it was, a pile of rock and these petroglyphs of these bovine figures. Lost for centuries, generations have longed to see this holy site. Now, it has suddenly been revealed, and the stunning evidence that still remains will shock you and make you a believer. We saw looming up in front of us this mountain, and the very unique thing about the top of it is that it's black on the top. Something of major consequence took place at this site. This isn't just a kid's game anymore. This, this stuff's here. This is real. Now, the search for the real Mount Sinai. The Red Sea at Yom Suf. That means Sea of Land's End. Pushed to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, the Israelites were faced with Pharaoh's chariots on one side and the Red Sea on the other. Without a miracle, they were doomed. We found an underwater land bridge that went from the tip of the Sinai Peninsula over into Arabia, called the Jackson Reef area. The crossing extends out across the strait, so we have pictures where Bob or myself are standing on this land bridge at high tide, and the water's up around my waist. We went on a diving expedition to survey this land bridge and it's this massive land that comes out of the depths of the deep ocean and creates a roadway through the sea to the other side. The people have to be able to walk. They can't just uh, slide down a cliff on one side, um, muck their way through the, through the silt and slime, and somehow scale a cliff on the other side to get out of this basin. Some type of um, submarine topography had to exist so that uh, as God supernaturally uh, parted the waters, the, the path that they would take could be dried out by the wind that accompanied that event. This underwater landmass comes up hundreds of feet from the deep. Now eroded by tides and shipping lanes, it remains to this day a testament to God's awesome power. Also, there's a mountain range there that precludes the people from escaping in any direction. They were hemmed in by the wilderness at this point. They had no place to go except through the sea. People usually think the water's going back this way and then closing, well it could have just gone this way and then come back in. It fit the timelines. Could you get across in this time period? Yes, it wasn't too far across. I suspect that's where the crossing took place. It's physically possible. This was straight up from the depths of the sea. This was created by God Almighty being omnipotent, knowing that the children of Israel would need this escape route. Now across, the explorers felt confident they had found strong evidence of the exodus. But with a foreboding desert stretched before them, the question remained, where did the children of Israel go from here? First, as they got out on the other side, they, they rejoiced. The Bible says they went three days into the wilderness and they found the bitter springs of Mara. Um, they should have stopped at some springs along the way, some bitter water springs. We figured it's about a 30 to 40 kilometer distance would be a three-day journey going through the sand with all those people and 
having animals and the elderly. And 33 kilometers inland, sure enough, we found these springs sitting right there by the road. And we went over and, and tasted the water and it was so bitter you couldn't touch it to your tongue. And we opened the Bible up and we started thumbing through the pages. We're thinking, what are we going to see next? And the Bible tells us that they came to the 70 palms and 12 springs of Elam. As we're driving along, uh, here's a whole bunch of palms, a whole bunch of springs. And th this is this like really, really blew me away. And within the palm trees, we found several springs of clear water bubbling up out of the ground. Now, today they have put these concrete encasements around these springs so that the water doesn't seep out into the sand. But we did find evidence of 12 springs of water bubbling up out of the ground, as the Bible says, amongst the palm trees. What would come next would be a surprise from deep within tombs. We first noticed I had a real old map and it said ruins, and we couldn't find these ruins. Eventually, we found these ruins at this area where the, the 79 palms and all the springs are, and the ruins are Egyptian tombs. There was a fence going around it with barbed wire. There was military guards placed around it. There was police jeeps driving up and down the street patrolling. And a local person said, oh, well, we call those the Caves of Moses. Like, you know, like we'd say, yeah, there's a McDonald's on the corner. So part of their culture, once you start with these people, well, yeah, Moses came through here. Don't you know that? What's wrong with you? The legend of the Exodus was still alive in the Saudi desert. And we had the chance to talk to a Syrian archaeologist. He heard us speaking English and came over and uh, wanted to strike up a conversation. And we asked him right off the bat, what is in those caves that you're doing archaeological research on at the edge of town? And he said, oh, we found writings in these caves that say that the prophet Musa, which is Arabic for Moses, that he came through this way with his nation of people, and that he camped right here by the water. As they drove towards the mountain, hearts pounding and eager to learn more, they soon found that this wasn't going to be as easy as they thought. And we found, to our amazement, that there's a fence going around the mountain. What we saw was fences, fenced off all around the mountain, great big signs in Arabic and English. That's the only sign we saw in Saudi Arabia that was both Arabic and English, other than at the airports. Everything else saw was Arabic. But here's a real, real clear, don't go behind this fence, archeological stuff, etc. We felt that we'd just find this mountain all alone in the middle of nowhere. Little did we know that this mountain is being protected by the Saudi government. But there was a rebellion at Mount Sinai. The Israelites forgot the God that brought them to safety and built and worshiped a golden calf made from the gold they carried out of Egypt. Bob and Larry wondered if they might find an altar and then uh, we said, well, let's see if we can find this altar site. And so Bob went off, and Bob, of course, having a better compass and sense of direction than I did, he would just like, Choom, went right to it. Thought, yeah, come on over here, come on over here. I'm going like, don't yell so loud. <laughs> They're going to hear us. <laughs> and uh, he, you know, he just nailed it right away. And sure enough, we found this altar that was about 30 feet high and 30 feet across. And there it was. Um, I'll call it an altar site, uh, a pile of rocks in the middle of very flat, barren land. Rocks are maybe 20 some feet high, maybe a little higher than that, very flat at the top. And these petroglyphs of these bovine figures uh, about halfway up, etched into the rock, not painted, etched into the rock. What you are seeing is exclusive amateur high footage of the Jabal al Laws area. This high footage was smuggled out of the country at great risk. But the most unusual point is that cattle are not indigenous to Saudi Arabia. It's sheep country, it's goat country, there's no cattle there. So to see a, a cattle, a cow figure on an extremely old petroglyph also really got me going, saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're onto something here. Later on, we did find that they were Egyptian artwork and that this probably was the altar that they made the golden calf because we have this ancient bull god, Apis, inscribed on several places on this huge altar. Now this altar was man-made. It would have taken hundreds, 
maybe even thousands of men to move the boulders in place to make this altar. Of course, they had the entire workforce of Pharaoh at their disposal, and they did have the skill of working on large-scale projects. The petroglyphs are representing Egyptian cattle, which of course are not native to that part of the country at all, and certainly would have been the kinds of cattle that they brought from the land of Egypt. It's not a place where someone would go and uh, counterfeit an Egyptian petroglyph uh, in the middle of nowhere where it's never going to be seen for no reason. So I think that's probably the most significant thing that was found there. And I think that was the sense I had, but like a po, you know, this isn't just kids game anymore. This, this stuff's here. This is, this is really, this is here. This is real.